Melissa Lampy, and I'm president of the Watertown Historical Society. And this is Marie Hilgendorf. She is president of the Dodge Jefferson County's Genealogical Society. And on behalf of both our organizations, we would like to welcome you to this very special event in this wonderful historic setting to celebrate local history and historic preservation. Is it good? Yeah. Okay. Can you guys hear? Can anyone hear? <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Yesterday, we held a very special ceremony here to formally dedicate the historic Shemp building as an official City of Watertown historic landmark. Today, we're continuing the celebration by introducing you all to the amazing gentleman who purchased this building 11 months ago and has already done so much for Watertown's Main Street, Mr. Bill Lamborg. building. Uh, a lot of you uh, know it as Kleins, as Kreskes, as uh, Montgomery Ward. So again, this is a this is a day that we're we're trying to reconnect. Sorry for the uh, the uh, noise here. We're trying to reconnect the community uh, to ourselves, to our history. One of the beautiful things about Watertown is its history. We have so many wonderful people and speakers today that will reinvigorate us with our great history what was in the past, which we certainly have to pay tribute to, uh, what is, which is a great town with full of life, full of history, and we also have to celebrate a new beginning, a new history, a new place to, to earmark where we're going. So today's function is, is hopefully connecting the past, uh, providing a bit of a vision for the future, and certainly introducing many of those pioneering families that were here for years and left their mark, and this is one of the remnants of, of that mark, and so thank you so much for coming. Um, one of our first speakers today is Mr. Nelson Fisher. His family, uh, as maybe many of you know, uh, have the Fisher Building here in town and had uh, uh, definitely a pioneering family and had many years of business and affiliation with many parts of Watertown. So at this moment, I'd like to introduce Mr. Nelson Fisher. just looking at the map here and uh, trying to figure out where we were. There's a dam down there, and uh, our original store was then right over here. And one of the interesting things for me has always been that that dam is about 12 feet high, and the, other, the dam on the other end of the town is 12 feet. So Rock River uh, dropped about 25 or 30 feet in this area. And that's, that's how the town got started from that the energy of the, of the river. Um, so a brief uh, history on our store. If I realized I was going to be up in front of this many people, I wouldn't quit. <laughs> um, our store started in uh, 1895, and my grandfather was the uh, original one in there. And his, uh, his uh, father worked in the store. And uh, anyhow, the Civil War ended in 1865, so you know, that goes back quite a, quite a bit of time. Um, there was a store in town called, uh, I think it was uh, Deer House, something like that, that my grandfather and a friend of his worked at. And they um, decided that uh, maybe they'd go out on their own. So in 1895, uh, they started out a store. Um, which was located at uh, right over there. Uh, shortly after the store opened, uh, Mr. Kellerman saw somebody run around his backyard at night, and he shot his pistol in the air, and somehow the bullet went up and came down and killed the individual. Uh, that was the end of our store. It just, uh, people refused to come in. So uh, anyhow, uh, my grandfather on his own went out and started uh, Charles Fisher at the time. So Charles Fisher being his dad. Um, okay, uh, so anyhow that was in uh, 1895 and 
And uh, originally we were in a Kuzel building, which uh, I think was over in Europe. We know it was over there. And uh, we were on the first floor, and the business kept on getting better, and we went to the second floor, and eventually we uh, ended up going into the third floor. And uh, the building had, a, had an elevator in it. Now, that, I don't know what powered it, but anyhow, we did have an elevator. So uh, in 19, uh, 1901, we incorporated, and um, <clears throat> in 1902, we opened up a store in Lake Mills. Uh, again, you, know, you, you couldn't get in a car and get there any other way, so it took two days to go from one store to the other. <laughs> Back then, it was... Uh, I saw a picture of, the, uh, of that store, and uh, they had a, they had a Christmas time. They had uh, a Christmas tree with a bunch of candles in it, and, and the picture showed that there were Indians on the outside looking in at uh, at the Christmas tree. Okay, um, in 1917, we moved to the Masonic Lodge, uh, which was across the river. And uh, in 1916, the Masonic Lodge had burned up. The structure was still there, but the inside was completely gone. And uh, they rebuilt it, and we moved in. And we moved in on the, on the first floor. The second floor was uh, were offices, and then the third floor um, was the Masonic Lodge. Um, after a while, the uh, the Masons didn't like the idea. You know, the buildings were like this, and so to go up to this, up to the third floor, it's like going up five normal floors. The buildings are just so high. In fact, I was just telling somebody at one time we thought about uh, putting in a floor between the ceiling and you know, the main floor, and if we could have done it with, with six inches of flooring, we could have put another floor in. So. <laughs> Uh, you got a lot of wasted space, you got a lot of space you got to heat. Uh, I remember uh, times going up there and changing signs and the uh, temperature would be about 10 degrees warmer up there than you know about that. Okay, um, so, um, and where am I at here? In, um, yeah, 19... In 1966, the uh, Masons decided that they uh, wanted to sell the building, they wanted to get on, on, a, on one floor. So we bought the building, and um, there were offices on the second floor, and those people left, so uh, we took over our store, Fisher's took over the first floor and the second floor. and. Um, we, uh, the only one that, that stayed in, in on the second floor actually happened to be a, um, um, a dentist. And I can tell you a funny story about that. Uh, after he left, uh, and one time Todd, my son, went up, you know, we're going to take the uh, dental equipment out of there, and he found a little bit of, uh, of mercury, just a real small bottle. And uh, we didn't know what to do with it. We didn't want to put it in the river or pour it down the sink. So we uh, called up the city hall. <laughs> Within minutes, the building was surrounded. You know, they had police out to stop traffic. They, uh, the firemen were out there. You know, they all had their mask on. And of course, we had, we had to get out of the building. And, you know, I, I remember they had a command post down there. And all these guys had masks on. And you could hear, you know, this room is secure. All right, move to the next room. And, you know, this went for a better part of the day. They wanted a special truck in from Milwaukee in order to haul a little bit of Rookery Way. But anyhow. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, at that time, uh, some of you remember when the city hall was, they, they put in a new city hall. And, and the old city hall was in the back of uh, our store. And we bought the building from the city and said, uh, you know, buy the building, but you have to put it in, you know, you have to put it in the parking. So that's how that 
that uh, big parking lot got back there, which was a uh, real benefit. Okay. Um, after that, um, we bought the two buildings next to us. They expanded into those uh, uh, buildings. And uh, originally, in our basement, we had uh, carpeting and all, you know, things like that. In fact, you did big rolls of carpet. You just come in and say how many yards you want. You had four or five choices, and that was it. And we had to be sold our clothing down there, men's clothing. And on the first floor, we uh, we had the men's and women's accessories. And then uh, the rest of that floor was made up of peace puts, uh, which when we started, that was the main part of our business. And then on the uh, second floor, we had ladies uh, ready to wear. Uh, when, uh, when we moved the uh, men's department from the basement up to the buildings next to us. The first year we doubled our business. Next year we doubled our business. It was just, it went like, really, really went. Um, one of the things I remember, we were uh, selling about a, close to a thousand suits or sport coat and pants per year. And uh, there were two men's stores besides our store and pennies, all selling men's clothing. And you all survived. And uh, some of you remember uh, Friday nights or Saturday nights here in Watertown. You couldn't, you know, they had police on every corner and, and the place, you know, everything was really, really going. And um, a lot of people came from Jefferson, Fort Fort Atkinson, Conwalk, and North of here. Well, I was dreaming about that happening again. <laughs> I don't know. Um, okay. Um, anyhow, um, my grandfather started the business as Eli Fisher. His brother was the uh, next president, then my dad was president, then I was president, and then Todd, my son, was president. So it really stayed in the, in the same family all the way. Um, <coughs> You know, after Todd and Lynn got in here, the business started going down, and uh, they had some great ideas. We tried the internet business, uh, and um, the problem that we that we ran into was internet business demanded one type of inventory, and then your regular business demanded another type of inventory, and you know, financially we just couldn't couldn't handle the whole thing. Um, so we did last, uh, well, our 100th anniversary was on uh, 1995, and we went to uh, about 2010. We were uh, listed in the Milwaukee Journal and Madison Papers. We were the oldest family-owned business in the state uh, when we went out. So um, I don't know. Anybody got any questions? I can tell you that uh, when business was good, there wasn't anything more exciting than being in uh, the business. Go ahead. What were the name of the buildings that you moved into when you expanded? What businesses? Oh, there were different ones. They uh, had, uh, well, one, at one time there, there, there was a meat market there, and uh, they said to Lala, they go, we're, we're when, we were, when they were there, we had uh, mice and rat problems <laughs> in our basement. Uh, probably shouldn't say that. But uh, anyhow, they sold records there. And, and um, the first building was two floors, and the, and the second building was uh, three floors. And there were apartments up above. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure. The, the next building after that was was a bank, so that would have been right here. So uh, I'm talking about those two buildings. And, well, that is the building that, that we had. But um, that, that was our location. I was just telling somebody else that the, uh, the basement of the building that we were in uh, had doors and windows. At one time, Main Street was at river level. And if 
flooded so much, I think, and anyhow, that became the basement. And, you know, when they put the bridge in. So, uh, okay, <laughs> any other? One question. Yes. When did the Fisher store and Lake Mills close? Boy, I don't know. I got a, a toy in the second. Do you remember it? Oh, I, I just want to ask you. <laughs> I remember the store, but I don't know what it is. All right. Um, I can, I'll look it up and talk to you about it. Yeah. Um, that, uh, our store Lake Mills never really did very well. Um, but anyhow. Now, so I, re now, so I remember you used to pay in the wire, the money would go up some kind of a line to the balcony where they would yeah, give you the change. Uh, what, you know, the, the office was uh, mid-level and they made the change up, because that was our office, and they had uh, wires that went down to different stations. And uh, what you did is uh, you put the, the cash and the sales slip in a little little uh, container, you know, put it back on there, and then pulled the, uh, the level, the lever, and then the spring loader would shoot up there. And if you didn't pull, pull it hard enough, it didn't get there. <laughs> and uh, if somebody was sleeping up in the office, you pulled it really hard to wake them up. So banged up there. Uh, then it, it, that happened. Then the, the next system we had was uh, was a pneumatic system, and um, you know there were two running through the, the building, and then of course we went up to the office. And it, when we started it with that, she put it, put things in a little like, capsule, and then we shot it up there. Well, my grandfather, you know, didn't really pay much attention. So when he started out, he just took all the money and, and the sales slip and stuck it in there and went out through the, jammed up the whole whole deal. <laughs> and, uh, I remember one time when I was working, I got a phone call, and a uh, guy was up in the northern part of the state. He said, you still have that pneumatic system? I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm going to call you at uh, 8.45 tomorrow morning, and he had a radio station. He said, I want to put the phone next to that pneumatic system so he could tell everybody about it. So <laughs> we're known for different things. Um, okay. Uh, one more. Go ahead. I just want to thank you. You had a wonderful store for several generations. Well, thank you. It was. Uh... If the store was still going, I'd be working. You know, it was so much fun being in it. And, you know, one of the things that made it great was uh, working with people. Ah, uh, yes, uh, yeah. Anyhow, when I got out of uh, when I left the store, I thought, well, I just soon start working or keep working. And the problem that I ran into, they, uh, people would hire me, but they'd want to hire you on Saturday evening, Saturday afternoon, and Sunday evening, or Sundays, you know, the times you didn't want to work, so you couldn't get them out to work. Uh, anything else? Okay, well, thank you. This is great to see this many people here. So uh, please, everyone, a round of applause. These are the, the Nelson family and what they contributed to Watertown, a true Watertown treasure. Thank you. So the, the, uh, the next event is we'd like to have the uh, Steinbar Quartet uh, play. And um, uh, we have Ken here that's put together a beautiful slideshow of Watertown. And you'll get to experience the history of Watertown on the slides, as well as some beautiful music. Please enjoy. <laughs>
the mountain. And I was born and raised in Watertown, <laughs> still living there. So it's uh, been quite a while. And I've enjoyed it very much. My father, Francis, was in the dairy cattle business and held dairy cattle sales, auction sales, on a monthly basis. <laughs> that was in Watertown. And uh, <clears throat> that was very, very successful. And uh, Sold a lot of dairy cattle. Uh, <coughs> dairy cattle were also sold privately by us too. After World War II, I returned uh, to help my father in the business, and the price of dairy cattle seemed prohibitive to certain areas and certain people. So I decided that we'd probably try a rental contract. <clears throat> we rented cattle out, dairy cattle out on a three-year basis, and uh, at the end of the three years, they have the option of sending them back or of uh, uh, purchasing uh, at a very low rate. In uh, 1992, I established a private foundation. Uh, in order to give back to the community some share of the success we've had. My wife, Sharon, joined me the following year and we were married in 1993. Uh, we now manage the Joseph and Sharon Darcy Foundation uh, with the help of a board of directors. We are able to donate generously uh, the areas to which we're able to make donations, uh, they must give, in order to give, they have to give officially to a 501c3 or be qualified through municipal ownership or religious affiliation. Uh, we have enjoyed giving back to the people of Watertown and plan to continue the program for some years to come. Thank you for allowing me to share the story. I will give uh, you now Sharon Darcy. Thank you, Joseph. I don't think I have to explain to you, I was not involved in the dairy cattle sales in any way. <laughs> Joe used to say I could manage a business or a wife, but not at the same time. <laughs> so he chose to marry after he retired from the cattle sales business. But I have had um, an incredible uh, learning experience with the, working with the foundation. It's amazing what can happen when you have a generous person like Joe. He really has given back so much. <laughs> and he will continue to do that. But it's exciting to be part of the program. He looks forward to the scholarships every year. I think that's his favorite thing. When we first started the foundation, you can imagine it, it was very small. We only gave one or two scholarships that first year, and they weren't very big. But this past May, we were able to give seven scholarships each for $6,000. Now that part was in the paper. <laughs> the rest of it, you seldom read about. Joe's a very humble man. He gives quietly and enjoys it very much. We have been able to um, give to the Watertown Historical Society. Melissa's aware of that. We're, um, because they do qualify, as she knows, through the 501c3, and she was very instrumental in getting that reestablished. Thank you, Melissa. Yes. Um, of course, the Watertown Food Pantry and all the other uh, charities that you're well aware of, we do give to each of our alma maters. That includes my school from Iowa and Joe's UW-Madison. Um, Watertown Family Aid, Watertown Food Pantry, um, the uh, 
Both the St. Bernard's and St. Henry's Educational Endowment have been recipients of uh, Joe's generosity. And um, Rainbow Hospice, uh, if I had my glasses, I could read a lot more. But, uh, each year now, we have been able to distribute about $100,000 every year, and it's fun. at all that Joe could not answer while we're still here. <laughs> but it's been a great experience for me just being along for the ride. Our board of directors continues to invest wisely and uh, they will be hopefully able to uh, continue that long after we're gone. The foundation will survive. Thank you. So again, another wonderful example of Watertown treasures right here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. I think the, uh, we wanted to uh, introduce Debbie, who is part of the Genealogy Society. Um, I go back uh, quite a few years with uh, Debbie. Um, I, uh, some of you may have read a little bit about my family history, but my first experience here in Watertown was to really uh, bury my parents. My mom had a, a wish to be buried with her family here. We have a beautiful cemetery uh, with all of our family there, mostly at Oak Hill. Um, and uh, it was a wonderful experience coming to this town for the first time and um, discovering it and to seeing what, you know, what we're doing here today. So uh, I hope all of you can take a little bit of of, of that passion back with you today and know that uh, this is a beautiful town, this is a beautiful part of the world and I've traveled extensively throughout many parts of the world and, and I love it here and, and I hope all of you will take a moment of time to think about Watertown and what we have and what we can build here. So I appreciate that. Now I'll turn the microphone over to Debbie. Welcome everybody. I'm so excited. This is a great turnout. I'm really happy to see everybody here. Um, yeah, uh, Bill and I have been working together. Actually, I believe we're starting our fifth year. <laughs> His family is just massive. And to my surprise, um, when um, Ken Riedel brought him over to my table and introduced him to me, I thought it would be just a normal family like I normally work on. <laughs> just, it, it, it was phenomenal. I mean, just um, so many families that, uh, anyway, I have just put together, I put together a few um, graphs of Bill's trees that are over on the tables over here with our um, Dodge County Jefferson Genealogical Society. If you want to take a look at them, and you can see his connection to the Shub family. And also, how many of you have family that has been here in Watertown uh, in the early 1800s, mid 1800s? How many of you? You all need to come over to the table there, the Dodge Jefferson Genealogy Society, and they can actually look up for you uh, your family name and tell you how much we have down in our little treasure mine down at the... I, I, if you don't know where we are, please ask. You know, there is so much down at the Genealogy Society for you. Um, and hopefully your research, but uh, I would like to thank Ken Riedel, standing right here, Ken. <laughs> he, he is the man that got me involved in all this, and I'd like to th thank the people that are with us from our Genealogy Society. We have Carla Borth, over at the table, Carla. Doris Riegel. Glenn Clark. Bob Wentz 
Foster, Barry Ma, and Marie Hilgendorf. They've all had great help. Um, so I put together a little, just a little short little slideshow here. Um, these are some of the things that you can find when um, you come down to our library and there's very many different um, here. Actually, this is from, okay, more brick blocker. George G. Shump, and that's a mistake there, is uh, now engaged in moving the wooden, well, you can read for yourself here. But this is something that I found in the, in the paper from the Watertown Democrat. We have lots of newspapers down there. Um, uh, we have a microfilm. You can come down and find obituaries and just so much. You have to come visit us. Okay, we can go to the next. Okay, this was an interesting one. <laughs> Chief of Police. H.C. Black of Watertown, Wisconsin, notified the local police authorities that a large quantity of valuable furs, men's and women's garments, um, silk. I think I'm too close. <laughs> and dry goods was stolen from the store of the Chef Brothers Company and uh, requesting them to be on the watch for any attempt that may be made to dispose of the stolen property. So that was, that was kind of interesting find. And this, I, I picked this out because if, if, if you come down just a hair, Ken, mm -hmm. it, that was in the New York Times. And it mentions the Shemp Brothers from Watertown. And I thought that was kind of interesting that show how, how big they were and how out there they were, the chef company. Okay, next. Oh, this was nice too. Um, building Dennis Black of the West, Jones Block on the east side of our office are rising above their foundations in fine style. When finished, they promise to be able to speak for themselves. Uh, Shem's Black, adjoining the John W. Dole, is also underway. The private houses of all sorts and sizes are now in progress of erection throughout the city. We are entirely too numerous to mention. And that was in the Water Day, Watertown Daily Times. Debbie, do they mean by a block, one building, or from corner to corner? You know what they mean when they talk about Dennis Block, uh, Chef Block, Jones Block? That, that was just, that would be like this block was called the Shemp Block. Yeah, 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 if they were on the Shemp Block, yeah. Yeah, is okay. Um, now here we have um, this is well down there we have we have um, Shemp family here. There's Leonard Shemp. Um, gosh, I should have had a second copy here. Okay, can we bring it down to see? Bring it down to see what year and. Okay, this was in 1880, a census that. There we go. And uh, is that Leonard? Oh, and there's John. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, this was, this was what a census record from 1880 looks like. And um, there's also, if, if we go to the next one, here's, here's the, um, this one is from when, when they were living in Emmett. And actually a lot of people didn't know that uh, um, 
John Shemp's parents had a farm out in Emmett. And that's what they were doing before they came here. And you can see their names there. George F. Shemp, farmer. Yeah, and they actually had um, Catherine, mother there. She was living with them out there in Emmett. Okay, next. Now this is a, this is kind of what they call a, a tick um, census, where they don't name all the names on the census, but what they do is they put, you know, two, two boys, uh, three girls, and just the name of the head of the household. And um, I just wanted to show you the different, different kinds of census records. There we go. Okay, we can go to the next. Uh, oh yeah, and this here, if you look at this, um, here we go down to, we have to raise, raise it, please. Now, this is Bill's relatives here. Plug, it says Plogman. Yeah, and, and that's one thing that I wanted to share with you is, you know, the names when you're doing research, never, they aren't always exact. You know, people wrote down what they heard. You know, if they heard, uh, Actually, that's supposed to be Plagamon. P-L-A-G-E-M-A-N-N. -N. And down, be down below here is Kruger, Kruger. It should be Kruger. K-R-U-E-G-E-R. And they just call them Kriegers. Yes? Oh, there we go. The Schwefels. Example of how they uh, really messed up the See, yeah, and I wanted that's that's part of you know part of your work with genealogy is you have to you gotta kind of uh, listen to what you're reading almost, and you know the people that were taking these census records and the ship records and stuff they just wrote down what they heard, so never get discouraged. Okay, next. And this one here, um, let me see. Well, there we have our, our Shemp family. I'm so, that's too close to my, my mind. I don't know what we're looking for. Oh. Oh, there, Ferdinand Spear. That's showing, um, now Ferdinand Spear was Bill's great-great-grandfather. And he was a butcher. And um, if you go down a little bit more, I think we have the shelves on there. Oh, it's so hard for me to read here. Anyway, this is another, um, that was another census that was, uh, no, here, here we have another, um, this was in the cassette. Sunday at 12 o'clock, Mrs. Joanna Shump, a resident of Watertown for 50 years, died at the home of her son, son-in-law, William F. Boss, North 4th Street. Uh, the deceased was her usual good health until the evening previous to her death when she accompanied, complained of feeling ill. Um, well, you can probably read that quicker than I can. <laughs> But anyway, that's that's these. This is an example of the obituaries that we have. Tons of obituaries down at our um, down at our library. So there we go. And also we have the we have the cemetery records. So you can we have um, I'm not sure how many. It's a gold mine. It's a gold mine down there, and um, this is George, of course. And, uh, okay, we can, yeah. 
Oh, this is the one that I was thinking of. Now, this is from the Weltberger. We have Weltberger books and uh, all the newspapers um, from the Weltbergers. This here started out, we have Ferdinand Spear up there, which was Bill's great-great-grandfather. And when you scroll down, mentioned in the same article, was, um, when you scroll down, um, you can, I can't see from here. There we go. Um, Theodore Huber. Um, there you have Carl Goldner, William Schimmel. These were all relatives of the Spears and Bill. So. And this is just something that I, I toss into when you're doing those tick censuses that I was telling you about where there's no names and just little scratch marks. This helps you, um, the census comparison form. If you get, you can pick these up or copy them off the internet and it makes it so much easier to read those census records. So that's, uh, I think that's pretty much all I have. So thank you so much. Please come visit. some of you down at the library. So, thank you so much. So again, just to uh, remind everyone, the, both the historic and genealogy um, societies here in Watertown are just a wealth of information. They have painstakingly indexed um, scan. Um, it's such a wealth of knowledge. So if you have any uh, family members that are kind of getting into their genealogy, um, please send them down to your research. It's a, it's a wonderful group of people and you'll be shocked at how much information that they painstakingly save. And again, it's, it's part of our Watertown treasure. So please take use of that. Um, another person I wanted to introduce today is, a, is my neighbor. Um, uh, Jim Body, he has the coal building next door. I'm hoping he is one of our our next recipients of uh, one of these uh, plaques that we earmark the coal building next door. The Cole family is a very prominent family here in town as well. You probably recognize the name, and uh, he is basically one of these uh, kind of new people that have come to town. Uh, not new here, but it, have actually restored his building brought back a beautiful use, have a wonderful business, and he and Carol uh, spend hours uh, bringing back uh, life to our historic Main Street. So I thought it was important to have him here today and introduce himself and, and tell a little bit about his, his building, his history, and his vision of Watertown. So please welcome Jim. It's a great pleasure to be talking to you and, and seeing you all here and enjoying uh, a recap of Watertown's history and looking at its future. Uh, I came here in 1990, uh, grew up on the south side of Milwaukee, lived in uh, a lot of farmland around. It, it was reminded me so much of Watertown where I grew up. And I serviced mortgage lending for Security Savings Loan, which became Security Bank, which became MNI, which now is BMO Harris. So I got to know a lot of people in Watertown, and I've always felt I've been kind of people oriented. Well, Carol had been president of the Watertown Business Association, and during her tenure, we had heard about the Main Street program. So we decided that might be a good route to go for revival of Watertown. So we spent about six months putting together the application, raising the proper funds to, uh, we had to get $15,000 a year from three sources, business, uh, city, and private donations. 
and had to have $45,000 budget a year for three years. We put that together. We're about three months into this application process, which took us about six months. And a local attorney pulled up to the corner to cross second and main going north. And a piece of glass put me in the position I'm in now. It blew out of the window on the third floor, landed on the attorney's car, his brand new Chrysler minivan. He promptly went over to City Hall, got the building inspector involved. The building inspector went through our building, and he it wasn't our building, structurally condemned the building. Uh, my thoughts with the building experience I have is that that building with one or two years of heavy snow would have collapsed. The attic, third floor attic, is a barn truss system. The barn beams, the beams are 9 by 14 inches. There are five of them that span the width of the building, 82 feet. Eight of those 10 ends had rotted out. One had rotted two feet back and it fell 13 inches out of the beam pocket. In the meantime, water, the roof had failed, water was curling in, getting in the mortar and bricks, deteriorating the mortar. When I went up there, I could reach in, pull out handfuls of clay and sand. So the building was very close to collapse. Well, after our building inspector uh, structurally condemned the building, a letter was sent to the owner who lived in uh, Charlottesville, North Carolina. He promptly came up to argue his case. He did not want to invest any more money than he already had in the building. And uh, the building inspector, with the city council permission, gave him a 90-day notice to complete the structural repairs of the building, at which time he said he would not do so. And while he was talking to the building inspector on the third floor, fell through the floor, landed on a joist on his crotch. So he had been arguing that the building wasn't as bad as, as the building inspector was telling him, but he promptly changed his mind. Well, his alternative, if the building was not structurally repaired within 90 days, the city would tear down the building at his expense and turn it into a 20-car parking lot. We felt that if we allowed that to happen, or the city allowed that, or whoever, I didn't know at the time, that we never would have gotten the Main Street program to work. So we decided to offer him a buck to salvage the building. And he made a very wise decision on his part because uh, it would have cost him about 350000 to have the building torn down. The city would have credited the value of the land against the expenses put in the parking lot, and he would have had to come up with three to $400,000 to pay for the demolition. So with the background in it, uh, Carol had been using an engineering firm in uh, Oconomowoc, uh, for structural repairs on houses she was selling in Carol's Water Street Realty. We promptly contacted John Robinson, had him come out and analyze the building. And uh, the report was kind of what I expected, but it involved a great amount of money and work uh, to restore. Uh, John Robbins was affiliated with an architect, uh, his name was Larry Cassins, he was in Delafield, I got him out here, and we looked at the building, and uh, Carol and I both pooled our money, 860000 we borrowed about 250000 we ended up spend, spending to this point a million three to get the building where it's at today. But I'm, I'm so proud to have uh, be involved in saving that building with its history. For those of you that don't know, John W. Cole and his brother Luther arrived in Watertown in 1838. And they built, a, or not built, but had a grocery store on North 4th Street near Stacy's Tavern, right near that corner. He eventually built uh, one of the first dry goods store, two-story wood structure on 2nd and Main across the street from where the coal building stands now. In the mid-1840s, they started manufacturing Watertown brick. He decided to build the coal building, coal hall building. Um, 
It was started in about 1849, finished in 1850. Uh, Luther had left his sweetheart when they moved here from Philadelphia. He tried to convince her to come back in the trouble with Chief Blackhawk War. <laughs> she would not move out of here, so Luther moved back to Philadelphia. John finished the building, ran it on his own J.W. Cole dry goods. Uh, J.W. Cole Hall had many fantastic functions. The ballroom, January 10th of 1854, the first state of Wisconsin Grand Military Ball was held up there. 155 officers and their ladies attended that event. They had to climb three flights of stairs, 19 steps per, per floor. I can just picture them in their military outfits with their swords, whatever, and the ladies in their skirts, finery. Uh, so we, we went on to uh, finish the building. We found out about historic tax credits that helped us somewhat. We were both, both employed at that time. Uh, I retired in 1998. We owned it full time. It took us 15 months to get the building where you see it today. Our first tenant was uh, Bellows Group Hub. There were two copper and stainless steel uh, bats, 10 barrel bats in the window that you might remember seeing. Uh, they were a tenant for five and a half years. Uh, gave us notice left in September of uh, 2007. Carol and I looked at each other and said, now what do we do? Well, my family heritage is German and Irish. My mother's side of the family was Irish, family named Lyons. So to honor my mother and my grandfather, we named it Lyons Irish Pub. And part of the reason I got involved with that too is my kids had paid for a round trip ticket and one week stay in Ireland. My daughter, Jill, my oldest daughter, works at County Clare in Milwaukee. She was the front desk manager there for 16 years and somehow convinced me in my 60s to be a bouncer there. <laughs> I worked 12 to 15 nights a year for special events, big bands. I even got to throw some customers out on occasion. <laughs> but because of my heritage and because of that experience and Jill's experience working there, uh, the owner of County Clare owns seven other facilities in Wisconsin, plus the, uh, he owned an uh, inn in Ireland where I stayed on my trip to Ireland. So there were a lot of feelings from those experiences and a lot of feeling for how we should decorate our pub, how we should handle it. And both Carol and I being involved with people, we really enjoy the work we do never in my life tired that I expect I'd be running a pub in my 70s. But uh, we've had, we have a party room on the side. We've had over 300 parties in there. We've actually had two weddings. We've had three Irish wakes, many wedding receptions, retirements, birthdays, you name it. In fact, we have a graduation party going on over there today. One of the things we've attempted to do is to bring a little culture to Watertown. We have, uh, from September through May, we have at least one, one weekend night, uh, three or four nights a month, we have Irish music, we have blues, we have jazz. We try and provide uh, some good entertainment. There's no charge to attend. We don't charge a cover. Uh, but we offer this for the enjoyment of the community. We have within, well, within the last three months, we've been working toward uh, trying to finish the rest of the building. What we'd like to do is a full-service restaurant on the second floor featuring Irish foods as well as regular cuisine. Refurbishing the ballroom, which, in, by the way, is a 22-foot high ceiling. It's cold. It has rounded corners, uh, a tray, so it's a recessed area. But because we're applying for historic preservation tax credits, which I got word were approved, partially approved, um, it will be restored as it was for that first military ball in 1854. 
We also uh, we have a flat roof area that was added onto the building in 1871. We want to do an outdoor deck, provide dining and, and adult beverages. Uh, we applied with the uh, state of Wisconsin a week ago Thursday for the 20% historic preservation tax credits. Never got official word, but I got a, I think somebody left the letter out of the package. I got a FedEx package on Thursday from the state. And Friday morning, Washington time being a little different than ours, Friday morning, 7 o'clock, I received a phone call from the uh, Historic Preservation in Washington, D.C. And the woman uh, that called was the head of the department and wanted to wanted me to answer a couple of questions, give a little bit of additional information, so I assume that process is going to be approved as well. Bill and I, in order to proceed, are uh, asking the city to put us in a TIF district uh, so that we can also, through that source, get additional funds to do this work. So I give my condolences to Bill or sympathies or whatever. <laughs> 15 years ago, I started my process, and we're still working through it. Uh, probably a lot having to do with it. deciding to take over the pub area and working 60 hours a week in there. Uh, lost a little enthusiasm, a little energy for pursuing that, but with Bill here now and his enthusiasm and energy, uh, I think we're both going to go forward with our hopes and dreams to. Uh, bring some quality things to Watertown, revive these old buildings, and uh, hope you all come over and enjoy it. I thank you very much.